Hey everyone, back again. As you can probably see, if you are watching this, this is a little bit of a different format. I'm in a different spot. Um, but this is actually going to be the first of a few episodes I do on the publications that I have out now because many of you responded positively to that poll I did about this. And this one happens to be on Jordan Peterson, which uh, I will give a little bit more backstory to this before uh, actually reading it. But I just wanted to say off the bat, the fact that all uh, of that Jordan Peterson stuff just happens to be coming out today, that article he wrote for the National Post is a total coincidence. I was planning to do this for a few weeks. So I, if you can believe me, I'm not just trying to jump onto that bandwagon. Uh, it turns out this, you know, he does this every few months to try to be relevant uh, again because, I don't know, his subscribers probably dropped or his rate of profits probably went down. You know, for whatever reason, he decided to pop up out of his cave again. So before jumping into that, uh, hi. I'm David, for those that are new. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, just know I don't normally actually ever do things that uh, are really germane to popular cultural stuff uh, in any way like this at, at all. I really talk about philosophical texts and ideas in ways that are in some, in some sense detached from what's going on in everyday life, partly because I don't really care about the algorithm all that much. Uh, and also, I don't want to draw any too much negative um, reception. So this isn't really indicative of what I normally do here. So if you're curious about philosophy or theory and stuff, you can go check out my channel where there are like 200 and some videos if you're new here. If you aren't new here, uh, as per usual, you can find this in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts. Or if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find it on YouTube where you can see the video if you're interested in that at all. Uh, if you want to help me out, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows? They might get a kick out of it. Uh, you can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And yeah, uh, let's jump into this. So this article is titled Jordan Peterson and the Flaw of Scientific Inquiry, colon, uh, a critical evaluation of Peterson's use of science and philosophy in his conquest against social justice. Now, this article came out in June 2019 in the uh, journal called Politicon. And this is a primarily a graduate student. Uh, it's meant mostly for students, this publication, which happened to serve as a good starting point for me to uh, actually start publishing. It's my first uh, published text. Before this, I had one translation, but this is one, uh, my own thing. And I had actually written this in, I believe in June 2017, so two years before it actually came out. Now, for those that have actually tried to go through academic publishing, you'll know I that's the case. And the reason that that is, is simply because uh, it can take a very long time. I submitted it to a journal. And once you submit an article to a journal, you can't submit it anywhere else. So you need to just wait and hope they get back to you. And I happened to submit it somewhere and I didn't hear back for a year, uh, at the end of which they said they weren't interested. So then I tried submitting it again. And then after that, it took about a year before it actually got anywhere. So that's why 2019 uh, is the date on here, but I wrote this in 2017. So many of the things I bring up here aren't going to be new to many of you. People have raised these points, they've raised these points much more eloquently than I will do here or that I've done here. Um, maybe it was slightly a little bit more relevant at the time, maybe it was a little bit more cutting edge at the time, but however you want to describe it. Uh, so yeah, I think it's that's kind of the back stuff. I wanted to give obviously to lay my cards out on the table I am no fan of Jordan Peterson what he does or what he writes uh, and I've engaged with quite a lot of it um, just to kind of put that out there I don't want to make anyone think that I have an, uh, I'm kind of ambiguous or have an unclear agenda I just want it to be straight up about that so let's just jump into this here and I start out with a couple of quotes as one does when you start an essay the first one is by Jean Baudrillard, where it's, he says that if all enigmas are resolved, the stars go out. If everything secret is returned to the visible, if all illusion is returned to transparency, then heaven becomes indifferent to the earth. And secondly, I have a quote by Friedrich Nietzsche in which he writes that what is the purpose? And worse still, what is the origin of all science? What? Is scientific method perhaps no more than fear of and flight from pessimism? A subtle defense against truth, or to put it in moral terms, is it something like cowardice and insincerity? To put it immorally, is it a form of cunning? O oh, Socrates, Socrates, what 
Was that perhaps your secret? Oh, mysterious ironist. Was this perhaps your irony? And that's from Nietzsche. And now from here, it jumps into my introduction. So on September 27th, 2016, Jordan Peterson, a psychology professor at the University of Toronto, released a YouTube video of himself speaking out against Bill C-16, a law proposed by the Canadian government that would add, quote, gender identity and gender expression to the list of prohibited grounds of discrimination in the Canadian Human Rights Act and to the list of characteristics of identifiable groups protected from hate propaganda in the criminal code. Now for Peterson and many of his right-wing followers, Bill C-16 represents a shift towards an impending totalitarian regime that seeks to restrict freedom of speech and deny scientific reason. As he stated in an address to a group of students at the University of Toronto, I've studied totalitarianism for decades, he said, and I know how it starts. According to Peterson, anyone that agrees with and promotes Bill C-16 must necessarily oppose logic, dialogue, and Western civilization. Peterson's video, along with his vocal refusal to adopt gender-neutral pronouns, mark the beginning of Peterson's rise to fame. This article discusses Jordan Peterson's crusade against Bill C-16 in order to challenge his utilization of scientific discourse to promote his ideological position on contemporary social issues. His arguments can be difficult to follow as they are riddled with aporias and contradictions that make a coherent analysis nearly impossible. For example, he has been vocal about his fear of a looming totalitarian regime while simultaneously calling for the complete abolishment of the Ontario Human Rights Commission that serves to, quote, promote and enforce human rights, to engage in relationships that embody the principles of dignity and respect, and to create a culture of human rights compliance and accountability. Despite this, this article categorizes his overall project into three broad conceptual domains that, and they go as follows. Number one, his arguments against and about postmodernism. Secondly, his scientific discourse. And thirdly, gender identity. The article traverses each of these three domains sequentially, giving credence to his arguments by constructing them in a coherent manner to allow for a steady theoretical terrain from which to mount this polemic, this criticism. The strategy is employed to give a face to an otherwise faceless argument and to make this dialogue possible. In relation to these three domains, this article presents counterarguments and evidence that destabilize the facile deployment of scientific rationality by Peterson and his allies and therefore calls into question many of his central claims. So this paper moves through each of these domains methodically, beginning with his juxtaposition of postmodernism with neo-Marxism, all the while claiming to be a faithful reader to Friedrich Nietzsche. The section demonstrates not only that postmodernism and so-called neo-Marxism are two incommensurable terms, but that Nietzsche's work has heavily influenced what Peterson labels postmodernism. Moreover, this section attempts to destabilize his problematic association of postmodern philosophy with totalitarianism. To do this, this paper invokes Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, a seminal text on the rise of totalitarianism in the 20th century. This use of Arendt's theorization of the rise of totalitarianism in the 20th century serves as a plea for Peterson and his followers to recognize the parallels between those movements, those in the 20th century, and much of the rhetoric that dominates our social zeitgeist today, at the time, summer of 2017. Moving from this domain, the second section presents divergent scientific data that attests to the reality of trans identities. This section presents a number of scientific studies on the increasing risks experienced by trans people today and the measures that should be taken to alleviate these risks. This section will serve the purpose of demonstrating the fragility of so-called scientific rationality and will call into question his axiomatic faith in science as universal and ahistorical. The third and final section presents the voices of those marginalized by Peterson and his allies in an effort to highlight the present efforts by marginalized folks to resist their erasure and the erasure committed by Peterson and among others. This section places these marginalized voices and their theoretical approaches on alongside the work of Jean Baudrillard and his consideration of simulation and singularity. Now that puts us here into section one, titled The Incommensurability of Marxism and Postmodernism. Peterson predicates a great deal of his political work on the flawed assumption that postmodernism is a threatening political doctrine that derives from Marxism. He often characterizes social activism as being propagated by so-called bloody neo-Marxists who wish to promote postmodernism, which he says is a pernicious and philosophically primitive and nihilistic doctrine. 
Peterson argues that the rise of postmodernism constitutes the first step in replacing basic scientific tenets with what he calls radical social constructionism, a theoretical framework that would, according to him, allow the left to replace a so-called objective truth rooted in biology and genetics with a socially constructed idea about human identity. He adds in one of his many public lectures that postmodernism is a well-developed and pervasive, pernicious, nihilistic, intellectually attractive doctrine that now dominates the humanities and social sciences. Furthermore, Peterson suggests that European Marxist thought defined by Richard D. Wolff and Stephen Kullenberg as a theory that distinguishes the production and distribution of surplus labor from matters of property and power he says that this has been reappropriated by contemporary postmodernists who have transposed the hegemonic Marxist relationship of poor against rich onto the broader postmodernist domain of the oppressed against the oppressor. With this argument, he therefore suggests that postmodernism is merely a clever Marxist sleight of hand, seeking, like its Marxist predecessor, to undermine Western civilization. So Claire Hemings problematizes this approach to postmodernism and Marxism, albeit not directly, by emphasizing some of the most significant differences between the two theoretical frameworks. She writes that postmodernism's attention to complexity of meaning and, and interpretation distracted us from the more substantive concerns of inequality, experience, political economy, and justice that Marxism attends to. Hemings extends this analysis by suggesting that, without a Marxist or other tangible approach to critical theory, we remain powerless to alter the pernicious power relations our post-structuralist tactics can cleverly identify but spectacularly fail to transform. Hemings's point stresses the lack of consistency between Marxist and post-structuralist theories demonstrating their fundamental incongruency in the domain of political action, with the former emphasizing a radical transformation of capitalism into a socialist system, and the latter belonging to the domain of theory interested in the immaterial conditions of signification. Jean Baudrillard, referred to some, referred to by some as the high priest of postmodernism, is one such figure that greatly disturbs Peterson's conflation of Marxist and postmodern theories. In the Mirror of Production, Baudrillard vehemently challenges Marxism, asking, are we quite simply within a mode of production at all, and have we ever been in one? Baudrillard extends this question by turning his critical gaze back on Marxism, suggesting that Marxism is predicated on the fundamentally Eurocentric tenets of productivism, scientism, and historicism, and that it homogenizes earlier societies under the light of present structure of the capitalist economy, therefore silencing specific socio-historical contexts, projecting onto them the spectral light of political economy. This book marked a fundamental turning point in Baudrillard's work, kind of a side point, is he grew wary of the possibility that Marxism could actually provide the blueprints for an effective mode of societal change. Postmodernism, as demonstrated with Baudrillard's work, does not share an indubitable affinity, dubitable affinity with Marxism, but actually condemns it. Baudrillard is not the only thinker indicative of postmodernism, that is, that camp uh, that was supposed to supposedly in bed with Marxism. Michel Foucault, for instance, who Peterson argues attempted to resurrect Marxism is another such thing. <laughs> I can't even, I don't even, I can't even say this with a straight face. Michel Foucault, who Peterson argues attempted to resurrect Marxism, is another such figure of the so-called postmodern tradition that has been highly critical of Marxism. In the order of things, Michel Foucault systematically avoids discussing Marxism in terms of economic theory in favor of many other liberal approaches to economics, indicative of the work of Adam Smith and François Quesnay. Foucault does this because, as he makes abundantly clear, he believes that Marxism exists in the 19th century thought like a fish in water. That is, it is unable to breathe anywhere else. And that's taken from the order of things. This sentiment resonates in harmony with the overarching themes of his work because he refuses to acknowledge that societal ills, or power, can be reduced to a single structural location. Thus, Foucault is highly skeptical of the possibility of a meaningful societal revolution because without a comprehensive evaluation of the many institutions that govern our daily lives, we risk perpetuating the same oppressive schematic. Peterson's definition of postmodernism, however, seeks to exclude this type of postmodernist critique of Marxism. For him, the contemporary postmodern movement is simply a new skin that the old Marxism now inhabits. 
made up of nihilistic yet dominating neo-Marxists guided by a desire to dismantle the structure of Western civilization. Although Peterson's fears of nihilism or the disavowal of moral or ethical principles may appear sound, his contradictory position on postmodernism is both fundamentally nihilistic and actively dominating delegitimate, delegitimate one of his central concerns. Additionally, the thinkers that Peterson cites as representative of the postmodern movement, Michel and Foucault and Jacques Derrida, and most notably, were greatly indebted to the Western philosophical and literary canons, with some commentators even lab labeling them neo-Kantians, among other things. Peterson's reduction of these thinkers to philosophical aberrations detached from Western civilization illuminates his own obliviousness to said canon, to the canon of Western civilization. Now this puts us into the second section, specifically Peterson's dealings with totalitarianism. Hey, he's such a funny guy. I have, I have very funny stories about him because uh, I've I inhabit many of the same social circles as his life, uh, and I know many, many I have funny stories uh, that I won't, I'm not allowed to share on here, but uh, he's such a, he's such a goofball, this guy, such a goof. So this is where we move into his discussion specifically about totalitarianism. Now in Peterson's Maps of Meaning, which is a kind of, some of you may not have heard of it, it's one of his, his first book, I think, um, after his dissertation. I think he wrote this when he was still working at Harvard, but in any case, his book Maps of Meaning. In it, he tries to grapple with and understand the historical instantiations of state-mandated fascist and totalitarianism in the 20th century. So one of the central questions he asks is, how was it possible for people to act the way the Nazis had during World War II? Good question. Very good question. Now, what is particularly striking is that Peterson makes no significant use of Hannah Arendt, the thinker of fascism and the totalitarianism par excellence. Now, I'd like to add to this, because I didn't mention it here, but Adorno, Theodore Adorno as well, who uh, worked on the voluminous, like thousand page authoritarian personality, probably didn't mention him because He's apparently would be associated with Marxism that is associated with the Frankfurt School. But anyways, he does, however, that is Peterson does, however, mention Arendt briefly to suggest that her seminal text, The Banality of Evil, would have been more appropriately titled The Evil of Banality, which is a d strange point to focus on and a strange argument to make. But in any case... The absence of Arendt's work and Peterson's exploration of these themes is suspicious and signals that his understanding of totalitarianism is missing integral philosophical insight. This is particularly true of the lineage he traces between nihilism and the development and emergence of totalitarianism. Even if we were to overlook the contradictory nature of Peterson's position on nihilism and political practice, we were to and we were to engage with his scientific terms imminently. His linking of nihilism with totalitarianism remains somewhat problematic. Now, as Hannah Arendt argues in The Origin of Totalitarianism, indifference to public affairs and neutrality on political issues are in themselves no sufficient cause for the rise of totalitarian movements. According to Arendt, it is the strong man rather than the indifferent public that has historically led to the rise of totalitarian regimes. As she explains, competitive and hostile attitudes are very useful for those forms of dictatorship in which a strong man takes upon himself the troublesome responsibility for the conduct of public affairs and hardly confirm to traditional or typical definitions of nihilism. Uh, and maybe to elucidate on this just briefly, in order for totalitarianism to really emerge, and we get this in Freud as well, this idea, people are not guided by nihilism, they're guided by hate. And for Freud, it, it's a sense of love, but a love that uh, manifests itself into a kind of defense against what threatens that love. Love of a nation that's going to be put under threat by uh, an imagined enemy and so on. So though Arendt's observations regarding the strong man and totalitarianism more broadly are based on her experience during the Jewish Holocaust, many of her theories seem to run parallel to Peterson's claims regarding scientific rationality and human nature. This is not to say that Peterson directly emulates the fascist movements of the 20th century, like that's a, that would be a ridiculous claim, as the comparison would be erroneous and misguided. Rather, 
Arendt's description of the strong man is founded upon the belief in a kind of human nature which would be subject to the same laws of growth as that of the individual. She has a strong affinity with Peterson's persistent reliance on essentialist positions as illustrated in statements like this about essential female and essential masculine pathologies. Arendt elaborates on these essentialist beliefs as irrelevant since Western philosophy and religion has been defining and redefining it for more than 3,000 years. Furthermore, such assumptions do very little to protect the rights of those who we consider human, but still deprive or are still deprived of expression within and acting upon a common world. These sorts of oppressive mechanisms through which human nature is established and used to justify the removal of legal and or political rights were used quite successfully by the Nazi regime during the Second World War, as Arendt explains. The Nazis started their extermination of Jews by first depriving them of all legal status, and then depriving them of their homes, therefore leaving them without territory and government of their own. By by expelling the Jewish people from any community willing and able to guarantee any rights whatsoever, the Nazis were therefore able to expel them from humanity itself. The oppressive mechanisms adopted by the Nazis are not only observable in the context of the Second World War, however, and can in fact be observed today. As Mary Ellen Donan reveals in the Shattered Mosaic study of um, homelessness in Canada, she writes that the national data indicates that although about 10% of the general youth population identifies lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, or two-spirited, People who identify in those ways make up 25% of the youth homeless population. Interestingly, such statistics are ignored by Peterson, who prefers instead to claim that Bill C-16 only poses a threat to freedom of speech. This attitude is exemplified in an address that he gave at the University of Toronto in which Peterson stated, in response to a trans person's concerns, I don't believe that using your pronouns will do any good for you in the long run. Peterson's silence on issues of poverty and homelessness in the trans community in Canada combined with his aggressive stance against laws that seek to recognize and protect trans identities and people, uh, mirror the tactics used by totalitarian regimes such as the Nazi regime to oppress marginalized communities. Any discourse that uh, goes after law establishing institutions in order to take away legal statuses and to maintain degrees of subjugation raise red flags for me. And that puts us here into the next section specifically Peterson's use of Nietzsche. So as previously discussed, Peterson's construction. Now I would like to say, um, I'm not even a huge fan of my arguments here. Uh, I think that I did a poor job and I was quite early in my academic life and thinking when I'd written this. So there are things that I'm not a fan of, things I certainly don't think today or wouldn't approach in this way today. Uh, And I think it's important for me to put that out there that I'm very much aware of my own limitations. So as previously discussed, Peterson's construction of contemporary social activism as a nihilistic and dangerous threat to Western values and scientific discourse born out of the postmodern movement is dependent on the axiom that the fundamental assumptions of Western civilization are valid. That's his act. He believes that. Though Peterson centers most of his core arguments around or on this fundamental assumption, His appreciation of Friedrich Nietzsche, a theorist described by the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy as a precursor for postmodernism in his genealogical analyses of fundamental concepts, especially what he takes to be the core concept of Western metaphysics, remains unshaken. But that's just the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. We probably don't have to take that seriously. So in The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche argues that the notions of truth that run through the course of history are founded not on their objectivity, but in their continual self-proclamation of objectivity. For Nietzsche, the shift from language to science placed the scientific method at the forefront of Western civilization, making everything quantifiable under the scientific gaze. As he explains, it is language which works on building the edifice of concepts. Later, it is science. Nietzsche expands on this idea, writing that, What I understand by the spirit of science is the belief, which first came to light in the person of Socrates, that the depths of nature can be fathomed, and that knowledge can heal all ills. Now, according to Nietzsche, this belief in the ultimate infallibility of science, or Socrates' tendency to murder art, 
destructive is destructive, especially when left unacknowledged. To Nietzsche, science is truly capable of confining the individual within the smallest circle of solvable tasks. As he explains, science spurred on by its powerful delusion is hurrying unstoppable to its limits, where the optimism hidden in the essence of logic will founder and break up. There is no thinker that would stand as opposed to Peterson as Nietzsche, whom Peterson repeatedly cites and applauds in his 12 Years for Life, that book that apparently needed a sequel. Uh, Peterson, in it, Peterson has remarked of Nietzsche that he is an absolute intellectual tour de force of staggering magnitude, and that he has influenced every philosopher of the modern age in one way or another, which is true, uh, at least I think. But in 12 Rules for Life, proclaiming the necessity for people, that is mostly young men, who comprise the majority of his fan base, as any, you can look up these stats yourself, uh, it essentially encourages them, encourages them to adopt an ascetic lifestyle in the form of mutated Christian conservatism. And this stands diametrically opposed to Nietzsche's central claim in the genealogy of morality or the genealogy of morals. Uh, that the ascetic ideal is not something to strive for, but is rather the consequence of a life attempting to inject artificial meaning into its veins in a poor attempt at inoculation from degeneration. So uh, the ascetic ideal, Nietzsche's using it to really describe like uh, the life of people who say no to enjoyment, say no to pleasure. Uh, he uses like Christian figures who um, essentially renounce their bodies in favor of God or whatever in order to give them meaning. Uh, they say no to everything they actually want in favor of this thing outside of them, which Nietzsche just completely has, has no patience for. Uh, that, is, that is a renunciation of your will to power, as Nietzsche would describe it. So in this capacity, Peterson resembles the ascetic priest that Nietzsche castigates. The task of intellectuals should not be to inject arbitrary rules and regulations into people, but rather to foster perspectival seeing that welcomes, in Nietzsche's words, more eyes, various eyes we are able to use, to sketch a more complete understanding of our objectivity. It doesn't derive from a single point. We need more perspectives. Now, according to Peterson, the Western scientific discourse he holds so dear is not merely threatened by a general postmodern movement made up of nameless neo-Marxist social justice warriors, but rather may be seen in specific actions taken by the members of this movement. These specific threats are especially apparent in relation to challenges made to the male-female binary. As Peterson explains, legislation, such as that of Bill C-16, that seeks to expand gender categories is patently absurd and undeniably driven by ideologues that want to push made-up words. Peterson is not so much concerned with the so-called absurdity of these challenges as he is with the threat they pose to his belief system. For Peterson, Rational discourse, objectivity, and scientific inquiry must necessarily be silenced for non-binary gender identities to exist because these concepts are paramount to Eurocentrism and the success of the West. Peterson dismisses any questions about their validity as intrinsically unfounded. So with this dismissal, Peterson therefore eliminates the potential for any meaningful dialogue that may not align itself with his fixed opinions. And Peterson's project is an attempt then to move away from the Nietzschean notion of perspectival seeing toward the domains of a historical and a contextual seeing. So there's only one way to understand how to be in the world, how to experience gender, how to experience one's life, and so on. And this narrowing of the possibility or of possibility operates to maintain the authority of those who choose what is considered worth seeing, and through what he means, pushing society through toward the sovereign and dictatorial rule. And that puts us here into the next section that is dealing specifically with the quote unquote science. Now the science versus Peterson. Though Peterson's line of argumentation seems to suggest a science slash postmodernism opposition, a considerable number of scientific journals have published articles addressing the growing stigmatization and discrimination, trans and genderqueer people, just to name a couple of groups, uh, experience regularly. Such articles, though they conform to the same scientific rationale utilized by Peterson, shed light on the great deal of contradictions, on the great deal of the many contradictions, oppositions, and divergent beliefs in the supposedly objective field of study. If it is so objective, why are there so many 
varying beliefs and ideas. Unless, of course, they're just embracing this perspectival knowledge that Nietzsche described. So these studies correspond to the domain of research that aligns with the Aristotelian, Aristotelian maxim of phronesis, which may be understood as fostering practical intellectual activity aimed at clarifying the problems, risks, and possibilities we face as humans and societies. This approach, although still immersed in the scientific tradition, stands opposed to the other domain of Aristotelian reason of episteme that proclaims the a priori nature of scientific knowledge. This brand of research, while disavowed by Peterson, presents a foray into the lives and experiences of marginalized groups that would otherwise be silenced. In their article, Transgender Population Size in the United States, this is the title of the article, for example, Esther Mirwick and J. Sevilius demonstrate just how restrictive and inefficient the gender binary can be for so many people in the U.S. In their study, Mirwick and Sevilius report that approximately 1.2 million people do not identify with their sex assigned at birth, adding that this estimate would rise by 1.5 times if it were to also include other forms of gender nonconformity. Additionally, Devane Al confirmed this position, arguing that in their study, that the recognition as human beings of trans and genderqueer folk requires a guarantee of core rights that recognize the legal personhood of these individuals. Still, to them, the acknowledgement of someone's gender identity is just the first step. As they explain, preventing human rights violations and social exclusion is key to a sustainable and equitable development that can only be established with systemic strategies to reduce the violence against trans people occurring necessarily at, at multiple levels. The harmful consequences of the stigmatization faced by trans people are further discussed in a study published in the Archives of Neuropsychiatry of Istanbul in March of 2017. This study, which included 99 trans men and 42 trans women participants, reported that the overall incidence of at least one suicide attempt among participants was 29.8%, and that of those that did, did attempt to commit suicide, 77% were under the age of 21. Furthermore, its authors suggest that as youth begin to familiarize themselves with their own identity, heterosexist false information, which normalizes, normalizes the binary, binary gender, can lead to the internalization of transphobia, self-blame, shame, and problems that can continue into adult life. Still, suicide is just one possible mode of harm that trans people may regularly experience. This disavowal of gender identities and sexualities and the continual denial of adequate health care, social care, and housing diminish any opportunity to generate a more accepting and open environment free of stigmatization and discrimination. The standardization of a limited gender binary that recognizes only two stable gender categories based on physical sex at birth, combined with the persistent refusal to acknowledge identities that defy this system seems, therefore, to cause much greater harm than do the so-called neo-Marxists Peterson is so deeply concerned about. Despite the growing body of scientific literature that supports and recognizes more fluid definitions of sex and gender while acknowledging the harmful effects of the oppression faced by trans and genderqueer individuals, Jordan Peterson continues to argue that attempts made to redefine and recognize a wider range of gender expressions and identities is a simple construction of people who have a political ideology. For Peterson, then, there is simply no way to make sense of trans and or genderqueer individuals within the realm of Western scientific discourse, and therefore any gender identity that does not conform to his objective and scientific definition of gender as a fixed binary system related to biological sex must be invalid and therefore repudiated. Peterson's erasure through the disavowal of trans people's chosen preferred pronouns consequently locates cis identities within the realm of reality and other non-normative gender identities within the realm of artificiality. Now here we move into the section where I engage with the work of Jean Baudillard, which, again, uh, not something I would do now, but at the time, it's what I did, uh, and some of these other arguments. Uh, I just mentioned, I feel like I have a much stronger grasp of them now and I would deliver better ones, but uh, this was a few years ago, so that's what we have. So. Uh, this title section, this section's titled Baudrillard Reality and Truth. So Peterson's categorization of people based on their connection to a so-called real biological imperative or ideologically motivated 
uh, political strategy implies that there is some kind of essential reality pertaining to gender identity that exists across culture and history. Though Peterson suggests that there is a fundamental truth pertaining to identity, and that this truth can be rigorously supported with the use of scientific methods, his claims do not account for the possibility that the gender binary is itself an ideologically motivated tool, and that there may in fact be no ultimate truth pertaining to gender identity. Jean Baudrillard has vigorously challenged the position held by scholars such as Peterson on objectivity and truth, suggesting instead that science, like any discourse, is organized on the basis of a conventional logic, adding that it explains things which have been defined and formulized in advance, and which subsequently conform to these explanations. The studies presented above, remaining faithful to the Aristotelian notion of phrenesis, resonate in concert with Baudrillard's theorization of science, because they do not refuse that science is valid and results may be concluded from them, but that these conclusions should not be transposed onto any societal or cultural context. That is, they are going to be culturally and, and contextually specific. Therefore, despite the many attempts to dissuade a Baudrillardian praxis for scientific conduct, these studies speak to the late Baudrillard's conception of singularity, which holds that every detail of the world is perfect if it is not referred to some larger set. This turn to Baudrillard may then appear to be ironic, because he's you know, a figure in this postmodern camp that Baudrillard, uh, that Peterson criticizes. So this turn to Baudrillard then may appear ironic given the implicit rejection of postmodernism by Peterson and many other members of the scientific community. However, uh, Baudrillard's version, or I guess Baudrillard's theory here, speaks the Aristotelian notion of phrenesis to broaden the conceptual and physical possibility of scientific research that is not settling or suggesting that science has been settled, but that it should be expanded uh, really a lot. Prior to exploring Baudrillard, it is important, though, to consider the ways that contemporary psychological research has become attuned to the nature of simulation and understanding humans and their relationships to the world. Lisa Feldman Barrett, professor of psychology at Northeastern University, has greatly challenged what she calls the classical view of emotion that maintains there to be universal attributes to human emotion and interaction. In her book, How Emotions Are Made, she disturbs this classical view by suggesting that the world is understood by humans through simulations, which dictates what we see, hear, touch, taste, and smell. Moreover, these simulations can cause tangible changes in your body. While Barrett does not draw a direct parallel between her own work and that of Jean Baudrillard, there are many parallels between these, their two conceptions of simulation. This is because, like Baudrillard, Barrett is trying to wrest the broader scientific community from the clutches of some kind of transcendent, universalistic assumptions regarding emotion in the human body. Barrett proposes instead that we become attuned to our relationship to simulation as opposed to these transcendent principles, because in her words, People spend at least half their working lives simulating rather than paying attention to the world around them, and this pure simulation strongly drives their feelings. Reality, for Baudrillard, is always caught up in a play of signification, and suggestions of a naturality made by the authoritative scientific community mistake the only true nature of the world as a world of appearances, in which there may not be anything but, in his words, uh, a discourse of the real and the rational. According to Baudrillard, then, notions of an objective truth are fundamentally flawed, and any attempt to occupy an objective field of study is bound to fail and merely become signs, signifiers of a quote, quote unquote, real signified. The, the fundamental impossibility of performing objective studies and or of revealing fundamental truths is understood by Baudrillard and his history of simulation. Uh, for Baudrillard, that is, simulation occurs when the world has become real beyond our wild ex expectations, and can be described as the outcome of a calculated move to put the illusion of the world to death. Scientific discourse that, discourses that rely on notions of objectivity and truth, therefore, dissolve into the imaginary of the sign, or the sphere of truth, and leave us with reality and therefore simulation in all its glory. The real, then, is merely a particular case of that simulation that Baudrillard argues allows our society to think itself and live itself as superior to all others. Peterson's understanding of the world is fixed, stable, decipherable, understandable, through the use of scientific rigor, therefore operates to uphold and reinforce the realm of oppressive simulation. 
For Baudrillard, the only adequate way to challenge something like Peterson's oppressive rhetoric within this realm of simulation is to engage with what he calls seduction, a concept he defines as the symbolic mastery of forms. Rather than attempt to understand the world as existing outside of appearances, representation, or ideology, seduction diverts things from their identity, their reality, to destiny, them for the play of appearances, for their symbolic exchange. Baudrillard's seduction opposes Peterson's scientific discourse precisely because seduction, seduction is able to engage with the world at the level of appearances. This approach, is, this approach remains faithful to his concept of singularity as it takes cultural formations in their demonstration of rites and rituals as imminent in any cultural faithful analysis in the form of science or otherwise. This line of argumentation may be observed in Baudrillard's earlier work when he argues that only a critique of the political economy of the sign can analyze how the present mode of domination is able to regain, integrate, and simultaneously take advantage of all previous archaic modes of production and exchange in for our trans-economic forms, that is. Baudrillard's work can then be read as not necessarily opposing the domain of scientific inquiry, as Peterson claims postmodernists are doing, but accounting for the degree to which any scientific inquiry should be attuned to the cultural and significatory conditions of their object of study. This critique of the political economy of the sign functions to simultaneously address the nature of signification while simultaneously challenging the historical and cultural instantiations that have culminated in its potentially oppressive existence. Without this sort of criticism, we run the risk of perpetuating the notions of a real method or approach to criticism that mobilizes the discursive and scientific tools of Eurocentric Enlightenment thinking that has been so categorically responsible for much of the hegemonic oppression that we find ourselves uh, associated with and, and see ongoing today. And it is in this capacity that Baudrillard is particularly effective at putting forth a methodological imperative for the realization of Aristotle's notion of phronesis, which might seem ironic, but anyways, because he refuses to suggest that there is a single way to conduct research, but that research and science may adapt to accommodate the given societal or cultural moment. Now this puts us here into this next section, Baudrillard, Butler, and those voices of the marginalized. Now the trans community is one example of a community that challenges the greater system at hand through a radical re-evaluation re-evalu- of the hyper-normalized position of, of cis people. Uh, and this is a point I certainly wouldn't hold or I would problematize today, but it's what we have here. Uh, Riley J. Dennis, for example, a trans contributor to the internet site Everyday Feminism, disturbs the strict relationship between gender and sex when she argues that sex is not a biological fact because it is determined by things that are largely changeable. Still, this is not to say that trans identity is inherently opposed to any biological fact. As Ricky Lane explains, if we simply dismiss biologism, we forget that there really is biology that we have to theorize through investigating what is natural, biological, social, and cultural, and how these categories develop and condition one another in discourse. Rather, biology is to be subjected to the same discursive challenge as is mobilized against the dichotomization of gender. This radical challenge to the scientific validity of the dichotomization of biological sex presents a Baudrillardian reversal. This reversal occurs when biological sex is inverted to mirror the highly unsteady terrain of gender identity. No longer, and we're talking here about uh, people who say that, okay, gender is made up, but sex is real. Now we're problematizing that and saying that, in fact, no, sex is, is itself a uh, somewhat constructed category. So this reversal occurs when biological sex is inverted to mirror the highly unsteady terrain of gender identity. No longer is gender something that is predicated on the objective finality of sex, but it is sex that is reversed to be predicated on the fundamental uncertainty of gender identity. In this instance, sex is reduced, seduced away from the objective finality of its biological imperative toward the form, in Baudrillard's words, which tends always to unsettle someone in their identity and the meaning they can have for themselves. Judith Butler adds to this theory, arguing that gender ought not to be constructed as a stable identity or locus of agency from which various acts follow. Rather, gender is an identity tenuously constituted in time, instituted in an exterior space through a stylized repetition of acts. By challenging Peterson's understanding of the male-female binary as inextricably linked to a transcendental natural apparatus, or transcendent natural apparatus, Butler confirms Baudrillard's theory of simulation 
outlining the play of appearances and signification emblematic of simulation and of gender, as she explains the replication of heterosexual constructs in non-heterosexualist in non-heterosexual frames brings into relief the utterly constructed status of the so-called heterosexual origin, thus gazed as straight not as a copy, for example. Uh, it is rather a copy to a copy. As both Baudrillard and Butler demonstrate then, to acknowledge the fluidity, diversity, and multiplicity of gender as a social construct allows us to move closer to the reality of the world, not further away from it. Assumptions about gender as belonging to fixed binary systems, however, illustrate our denial of the world as illusion, and therefore further remove us from our world. Perhaps Baudrillard says it best when he writes that, at all events, illusion is indestructible. The world as it is, which is not at all the real world, perpetually eludes the investigation of meaning, thus causing the present catastrophe of, our, of the apparatus of production of the real world. So true is it that illusion cannot be combated with truth. That is merely to redouble the illusion, but only be a higher illusion. Jordan Peterson is characteristically emblematic of a drive to purge the world of all illusion. His reliance on scientific rationale and a very specific scientific rationale at that attaches meaning to a world that is first and foremost unnatural. For Peterson, there is a truth beneath the illusion. With enough science, reason, and rationality, this truth may be attained from under that heavy weight of illusion. Peterson's failure then to ask if the only truth of the world is that beneath the bedrock, is that which is beneath the bedrock of illusion, is only a really a greater illusion that he's participating in of a kind of Western archaeological desire to uh, proffer itself up as the uh, purger of illusion. So what will remain then once the final illusion has been purged? Which is what? I guess that's how I end it. Uh, and we get more of, um, or what I would add is that uh, certain texts from Nietzsche that also question this idea of truth that go a little further into the question of um, or lying or falsity and how really we are duping ourselves if we claim to find the truth of the world. And yeah, that was that. I hope that that was enjoyable, uh, that you enjoyed that. I'll add a link to it so you can go and read it if you want. If there are any comments about it, I'd love to hear it. Um, I'm very much aware of the limitations of it, but you know, I still don't let that dissuade you. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And um, yeah, take care. <laughs>